Stefan, welcome to Validated. Thank you. Thank you, Austin. It's great to be here. So this is an episode I've wanted to do for a while. Uh, we've had the CTO of Ledger on before to talk about sort of hardware wallets and hardware security. Um, we've spent a lot of time on this show sort of explaining a lot of the basic fundamental uh, building blocks of blockchain, how the intersections of ecosystems interact with all sorts of different components. And security is one of those topics that uh, it's a little bit of an eat your vegetables thing, but it's also the foundations of what make blockchain possible. So I I'm really excited to to talk with you today about uh, security paradigms, operational security, multi-sigs, um, how this crazy world uh, got built, how it we, we see it today and sort of where the future of this stuff is going as more and more of our lives move on chain and more and more businesses kind of start adopting blockchain technology. So uh, yeah, let's get into it. Yeah, amazing. I'm excited to, to be here. I'm a big fan of the show. So I want to start today with a deceptively difficult question. What is a multi-sig? Right. Uh, I mean, we we went through a lot of definitions over the years. Uh, I think the one we landed on is the more agnostic one, where we talk about multi-sig as being this very simple consensus mechanism that allows to execute transactions on a blockchain uh, by requiring multiple signatures. And uh, that is really the sort of the final definition we landed on. And then you can really use it for a multitude of things. Like more traditionally, they've been used, multi-sig consensus has been used as a wallet system, right? So that allows for a group of people or, you know, a single person with multiple keys to manage a treasury, manage uh, different, you know, treasury assets like NFTs or fungible tokens. And I think as we, and we can sort of, sort of can talk about the progression of this, but um, it really, I think, went a lot further in the last couple of years in terms of what this consensus can manage. And really, uh, right now, it, it, it is very agnostic. So on Solana, we can see, you know, validators, tokens, programs being managed through multi-sig. And um, it feels like, you know, every few months we discover a new, uh, a new use case that, uh, that can be managed with this. And so uh, it, it, keeps, it keeps evolving for sure. Multisigs seem like an idea that seems pretty fundamental to blockchain security. This is the sort of classic two-factor authentication thing in the Web2 world where, uh, you know, if I'm going to log into my Gmail account, maybe I need to go pull a code from Google Authenticator. Or if I'm going to send a wire transfer, my bank sort of has me enter another two-factor code that comes from an independent device. And with all the emphasis that the crypto world placed on self-sovereignty and, and sort of security and all these sorts of things, this seems like something that sort of almost should have been baked into blockchain from the beginning at the protocol level, as opposed to it having to be something that a company like Squads builds on top of the protocol. So walk us through a little bit of like the history of, of where this idea came from and sort of why it wasn't there at the inception, the way something like a wallet was or an address. Right. I think it, it is definitely, um, it, it grew, the necessity for multisigs really grew with um, more value I think accruing to the, you know crypto assets specifically I think Bitcoin originally, and um, the very first Bitcoin multi sig isn't actually you know smart contract world multi sig. It's done completely off chain where you basically you know generate a bunch of shards from a single a key and everybody holds that. And so the, it, it is really not programmable in the way that we've come to know multi sigs today. And that's been this very sort of original uh, version of it that is really. What was really about additional security, or you know, as you kind of mentioned, all all these like two FA examples, basically two FA for holding your Bitcoin, right? And I think that's where hmm. it really originated from. And I think as uh, Ethereum started growing and and gaining popularity, and it was really emerging as this sort of smart contract wallet, a smart contract platform, um, an idea for a smart contract wallet where you can secure a lot of this logic on chain, um, really became real and actually happened on Ethereum first, and then. You know we're now iterating on those sort of early primitives on on Solana with with new ideas. Yeah, I mean one of the I think the core ideas that this show is about is that things that used to be technology problems on blockchain are are rapidly becoming human problems on blockchain. Um, so you could see a world where you roll back four years and like there really are no good multi sigs that exist on networks other than Ethereum, and they're still very immature on the Ethereum stage. Now we're at a place where almost anyone who wants to deploy a multi-sig can, either for like a personal wallet or for program upgradability, a company treasury, whatever whatever it happens to be. Um, but again, one of these core tenets of blockchain is there's no undo button. There's no there's no reset. Like 
if I hold the keys to something at the Solana Foundation and they fire me tomorrow, uh, they can log into my Google account and they can pull a bunch of that stuff out. They can get access to my one password. There's like this whole uh, like corporate account recovery structure built into the Web2 ecosystem. None of that really exists on blockchain, I think, for for largely good reasons, right? You, This is part of the security guarantee is there's no undo button and there's no master override. How does that sort of mesh with these businesses that I'm sure you guys work with that are starting to come on chain and they have to think about like, okay, um, maybe I'm a protocol team and I want to run payroll for 60 people in 35 countries and like the easiest way to do that is USDC. Uh, but at some point, there are keys that a group of people own that is both an attack vector, a compromise vector, and a potential just general problem if if those individuals leave or the classic, you know, one day, unfortunately, they get hit by a bus and suddenly we're locked out of all of our accounts. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, like, um, it's interesting that in, in Web2, like, this idea of, you know, 2FA or multiple signatures really came about in the context of individuals, right? It, it's kind of more for extra security for my sort of personal interactions on the internet. It's interesting that in crypto, it really started in a different place. It started with organizations, I think m- more so than, than anywhere else. Mm. And really it's about, as you were talking, right? It's like gr- groups of people that want to manage these on-chain assets together. Um, and we are really, the most use cases we see right now are very on-chain native, right? So it's kind of like we are, um, you know, a startup that's building something on blockchains and we raised, uh, you know, funding or we got a grant or we have a program that we just deployed on mainnet. And it, uh, it's it's of, of huge value to the team and uh, having it controlled by a single key is, you know, a single point of failure. It's an attack vector. And, and I think it gives a lot of comfort to everyone on the team knowing that there, there's this, you know, immutable piece of code on a decentralized blockchain that's responsible for uh, managing our assets and, that that logic is secured there, as opposed to it being, you know, with secured with trust into an in an individual, right? That that's actually just holding it on, on their ledger. And I think um, right now we are in a place where it's becoming really customary, and it's just it, it it's it's the first thing that most teams do when they actually form uh for form a team to build something. They actually create yeah. a multi sig. That's where they put all, all the main assets. And I think as, as you can sort of. I guess, differentiate like all types of um, infrastructures that you can rely on to cast different on-chain assets. Like, you know, you can do that on a centralized exchange. You can do it in a cold storage, hot wallet. I think multi-sigs are really solidifying as this core primitive for organizations. But we're also starting yeah. to see with like, you know, I guess we'll, we can dive in later in, into it later, but like account abstraction is becoming a huge topic. And I think we might see... Uh, you know, the infrastructure that actually underpins uh, multi-sigs uh, get into this more kind of individual-facing space, right? A- a- as where it started, traditionally it started in Web2 with that, right? And so I think we are seeing that shift coming to life right now. And so I think uh, we-, we might see more of, the- more of that infrastructure in also sort of other realms of, uh, of asset custody for sure. Yeah, I want to get into sort of more about how multi-sigs are, are used today. But, but first kind of just... Um, a foundational question here. There was a point in time when I think most institutions and many protocol teams thought that they wouldn't necessarily need multi-sigs and that they could do this all through on-chain governance. That they could basically say like, oh, we're going to form a DAO and the members of those DAO are going to be, let's just say the executive team at you know Jupiter Exchange or something like that. Um, that model has sort of fallen away in favor of multi-sigs. Um, do you have a sense of why that occurred and why sort of the industry decided that governance was probably not the right application for this and that a multi-sig really was the best the best thing? Well, I think it, it really depends because like there, there were many teams that went with the sort of governance framework originally because they actually wanted to decentralize control over the core assets like very early. And it was really important for them to, you know, signal that as soon as possible. So they relied on the infrastructure and, and tooling that is really more in the DAO realm as opposed to like it being just a multi-sig. Um, so that's like one bucket of, of protocols that that we saw. And then the other one is where it really is just, you know, it was centralized. Uh, it should have been centralized. They wanted it to be centralized and they just used the sort of DAO infrastructure 
to facilitate it, right? So I think that's like an important yeah. distinction. Uh, I think just the multi-sigs are a much simpler mechanism because there's no fungible tokens involved. And so it's a stricter consensus, right? And it provides you yep. more certainty about what needs to happen for the assets to essentially leave the leave your control, right? Because it's just, you know, here are the keys, here's the threshold. And it is getting more complex with like granular permissioning and like you can make it more a more complicated system, but the very core logic is very simple. I think with governance, um, it is more complicated, right? Because also uh, when you have, you know, a, a large supply of liquid tokens involved in this, uh, it potentially, you know, th there's different kinds of attacks that are possible that are not really possible with a multisig. And so I yeah. think the way... Um, that's, that, that, that's, I think, what facilitated the shift. But there's also, I think there was like a cultural shift in the last couple of years. I think as more sort of forward-thinking blockchains like Solana, uh, you know, came online and attracted a different kind of builder um, to the ecosystem, I think you started also seeing sort of, in, in, at least on the protocol side, that there's like, on, on Ethereum, as, as, as I remember, like, you know, a couple of years ago, everybody wanted to build a protocol, decentralize as soon as possible, launch a token, and kind of like you know, let other people build on top. I think Solana really um, made it possible for you to build on the blockchain, but be, you know, at least at the outset, a company that is, you know, iterating at the product that has a vision that wants to deliver something and then decentralize. And I think that also, you know, that shift facilitated the need for a different kind of tooling. And I think that's also what made multi-sigs, uh, I think, more popular. And right now we're also seeing that on, on EVM. Uh, right now, yeah. EVM... Because multi-sig, even when we started, when we would talk about, you know, we're building something multi-sig related even, it would be like, oh, DAOs, it's for DAOs. And right now, hmm. it really is on both, you know, sides, it really is, oh, it, you know, it could be on-chain organizations, could be companies, startups, institutions. So now, it, you know, the, the pool is really broadened in terms of who can actually use this, this info. And yeah, we're glad about it. So... Uh Let's go through some of the both use cases for multi-sigs and then some of the examples where teams uh, did not implement multi-sigs and uh, sort of paid the price for that decision. I, I think the first one I can I can think of on that is um, sort of what happened with Serum around the FTX collapse last year, where uh, there was no... When, when FTX collapsed, there was a credible concern that some of the program keys or upgrade keys for Serum... Uh, maybe in the hands of someone who could act maliciously. Um, but that, inf in, you know, to the date, I don't think there's been any exploit of serum that happened. There was no evidence that anything like that did occur. But the, the fear there was enough to lose confidence in that, in that protocol. Um, do you think that was entirely just because no one knew who, who held the keys? And it, is there sort of a way that in a situation like that, um, you can tell if a program is using a multi-sig or if it's not. Um, I think Serum was definitely a, a big one for at least Solana ecosystem. I think uh, just to maybe give more context, like Solana programs are by default upgradable and most protocols on Solana are upgradable. And so there is this thing that that you know we call upgrade authority that needs to sit somewhere. And it can be, you know, again, controlled by a CLA wallet, can be controlled by a ledger. And... Um, when we launched our latest version, a, a big focus for us was program management and the idea that this this is one of the first things you should really transfer to the multi-sig to, to manage. Because if I have the upgrade authority to a program, I can ship an upgrade and you know drain it of all of its TVL or make any kind of malicious changes. So it definitely is, is, a, is a high value asset that you have and you really need to manage it securely. So when Serum happened, uh, when, when people realized that you know the upgrade authority is um, with a some kind of wallet, like at, at least I think at the time through Explorers, everybody could say that it wasn't a PDA. So uh, that, that basically right. meant that it's not a multi-sig, right? So even right now, like looking at, uh, you can type in, you know, the address of the program that you're interacting with on Solana into any of the explorers, and then you will see, um, at least you can identify whether the um, owner of the, the, the holder of the authority is a PDA or just a regular account. And I think that's probably the, it, I think, there's definitely room to make it more apparent, at least on the Explorer side, right? And I think Sol like Solana FM uh, and, and I think SolScan lately also were sort of going in that direction. I think also X-Ray. So everybody, I think that that, that is uh, becoming much easier to identify. Um, but really, the Serum moment was really important for the Solana ecosystem because I think developers and builders always, obviously, you know, they, they're dealing with upgrade authority all the time, right? Because they need to yeah. deploy a program, then they need to upgrade it. So they know it exists, they know it's important. And 
prior to Serum, for many protocols, it was like, well, you know, we've been using something for a year or six months. It's a setup that we have. It's either, you know, our own multi-sig fork that doesn't have a UI that's like not really audited, or it's like a CLI wallet that just, you know, we keep very securely. Th that was the, I think, sentiment for many teams at the time. And then when Serum happened, uh, people started talking publicly about this issue on Twitter and, and on Discord. And then users uh, on Solana like started to really understand that this thing exists and the potential impact that it can have, if, you know, if, if the upgrade authority is in malicious hands. And that really, I think, like facilitated a lot of the protocols realizing, okay, we now need to to deal with it uh, because like our users are also, it, it became a, like a, a, a question that everybody was asking, like, where is that with authority to my, you know, insert favorite protocol? And so yeah. I think once that happened, um, a, a lot of those teams realized, okay, we need a, you know, we need a multi-sig solution to, to manage it. And I think, yeah, fast forward a couple of months, or I think it has been what, almost, almost a year, right? Like eight months, I, I think since. Almost a year. Yeah. It's, uh, right now it is sort of, um, the question that, that, that is asked, like, is your upgrade authority, uh, in squads or not? Uh, which I think was, was one of the sort of big, you know, uh, initiatives we, we were trying to like, uh, make happen on, on Solana. But really, is program management, I would say, is a killer feature for squads to date. Like, there is a lot of treasuries that, you know, people manage all kinds of things with squads, but program management is very important. And I think it is kind of, um, in many ways, novel to uh, blockchains. Uh, and it's like, it's the first time we really took it to its furthest extreme, where we, like, have a, you know, full program management flow uh, because a lot of pro programs are upgradable, right? Because on Ethereum many programs, most programs that are deployed are non-upgradable. And so there wasn't really a need for that kind of tooling, at least to the extent that we uh, took it forward. And so I think Solana is pretty unique in that sense. I think, you know, more programs are going to be immutable. And so that that's sort of going to be a natural cycle. But also, you know, I think it's it's very important to, to understand that like at very early stages of protocol development, program your program very likely should be upgradable, right? Because you want to iterate fast, right. you want to ship things. Like for us, even... It's, uh, you know, immutability is very important, but it's a huge pain because we need to, every next version of the protocol, we need to ship a new program and it's just, it's, it's a whole other story, right? But I think, uh, yeah, so for, for now, I think that, that really that really works well for the ecosystem. And um, I'm glad that Serum ended up not being actually, you know, a hack or any, any issue. It actually only had positive impact on the ecosystem from a standpoint that, you know, the issue became apparent, it was raised, it was addressed. And so I think we are... Uh, out of the woods on, on that one. Yeah, you know, it, it's kind of interesting because we talk a lot about how programs on Ethereum are immutable, but they almost always have a mutable wrapper program where the user actually interacts with. Like, the address for Uniswap has not changed, even though we've gone through multiple versions of Uniswap. That's only possible because there's a mutable wrapper program. And sort of the solution for that um, from that community has been time locks, where... You know, the, a program can basically say it will be upgraded at this point or the last time the upgrade occurred was was X or Y or Z. Do you see sort of uh, a need for that sort of tooling on Solana? Do you think the wrapper programs are, are fundamentally a good approach here that we should see more of on Solana? Or are there alternatives that since we're dealing with a new architecture that can do new types of things? Yeah, I think that's a very that's a very good question. We've been thinking a lot about this from, from all perspectives. I think in another... Um, I think another property of Ethereum programs that we noticed that we've been trying to think about more is that they're inherently more modular. Uh, I, I know that that mm -hmm. gets into a different discussion, but like um, they are um, like it, at least it's easier to make parts of them immutable and then like other parts uh, immutable, and that, that's what we sort of discovered. I think Solana is just a bit harder. Um, but I think to yeah to to, to answer your question um, on Solana. We are about to launch uh, time locks for V4, and we've been thinking a lot about how they can work and uh, whether like it's it's actually a good thing. Uh, I think in Ethereum they've been very, as you mentioned, like they've been really adopted heavily by major protocols. Uh, from our perspective, it's uh, I think on, it, it's great from you know community perspective, right? Because it means if an upgrade uh, is queued up and uh, it's been approved by the DAO or the multisig and uh, it, it's about to go live, there's a basically a time gap, right? Before it can actually be executed. So if you're worried about, you know, if you don't like what the upgrade is doing to the protocol, you have a time frame as a user 
to go and you know pull your funds or you know do, do whatever to, to sort of address your concerns. Uh, the flip side of that though is that if there is a you know there's a bug and that can actually you know lead to loss of funds, to be able to change the program to address it, the time lock also applies. And so yeah. if somebody is watching the program, right, that also creates an issue where it's sort of a race against time. Like they, they need to, you know, they will probably be trying to, to, you know, to hack the program before the, you know, fix is executed. So it also yeah, creates right. certain constraints um, that that are also, I think, important to to mention. Yeah, I mean, everything is a series of trade-offs, right? That That's one, one of the universal consents about blockchain is there's no right answer. There's just a series of choices you have to make and hopefully you pick the choices that, are best for you, because uh, one of these one of these classic examples too is like if you have your funds in a multisig, and then you see something like oh I th- the market's moving a lot I I want to sell or I have lost confidence in this particular program I'd like to pull funds from it. Um, there is this sort of asymmetry where uh, it may be hard to do that. Like if you have a multisig that requires three of your GPs to sign off on it. Uh, one of them might be in Tahoe. One of them might be on an airplane. Like there, there's a whole series of things that may occur that would prevent that sort of transaction from executing. I'm wondering if you've, if you guys have thought at all about like asymmetric multisigs, um, or if that's even something that like is technically possible, where uh, certain types of actions. Like I, I know we've gone through this on like a treasury side, where you could create an account where someone could only send funds up to a certain dollar value. Um, but if you thought about this from sort of the perspective of like there are certain types of things that might be considered protection operations versus like deployment operations, and you can set permissions differently based on what the smart contract is trying to do. Yeah, I think we've been actually sort of diving into that for the last couple of months. Uh, I think the um, sort of institutional uh, MPC wallets like Fireblocks and Copper and sort of the other providers, um, they have that. They had that for a while because, like, that's uh, that's been a direct requirement from their users. Like, institutions do want sort of granular control. They want to be able to say, you know, you can only interact with this program. Uh, so, be, you know, just program whitelists, program blacklists, spending limits, like, uh, just more granular control on what can be done. Um, I think we are, uh, but the, the the trade off there, by the way, with you know all the NPC wallets is that all of this logic is done off chain. So, right. The, um, from the on-chain perspective, it's just a regular account, and then all the transaction policies, including the uh, the sort of MPC protocol itself, it's all off-chain, right? It's all hosted um, in you know by a private company in their offices. They they have you know Web2 infra stack that that scales with with how they grow, and it really is you know more uh, much more of a sort of Web2 I guess way of securing uh, assets as yeah. opposed to what we're used to, and I think um, with you know what's possible on Solana. I don't think it's actually only possible on Solana, but it's a lot more of it is possible only on Solana. Is definitely bringing more of that logic on chain. And so I think, mm. um, in terms of like to, to, in terms of asymmetric multi sigs, like just more granular controls. Um, a lot of it can be done on on chain. Like for instance, yeah, right now in terms of program whitelists, that can be done as well. But that, however. Um, potentially makes the program a lot more complex. And so we've been actually thinking about this just last couple of weeks because we've been thinking like how much of that we can address uh, on chain to make a comparative offering, you know, for, for institutions that want to trade on Solana and have the same level of control. Um, and, and some of it is possible, some of it is not. I think the, uh, as we've been doing also some research from institutions, like program whitelist is the biggest one. Uh, and the reason it's kind of complex is because, um, you know, for instance, if you're doing a, you know, swap on Jupiter, you're also potentially interacting with a lot more programs than just one. And so uh, I yeah. think for now, it just might be a bit too early to understand like how to um, how to actually make it scalable uh, on that front. I think right now, doing it off-chain is just much easier, but you know, potentially less secure, uh, or at least a lot more centralized. And Certainly. so, yeah, I think I think right now, like in terms of uh, any kind of asymmetry and, and bridging that gap, like I think... Uh, if you look at our previous iteration of uh, Squats program, it's just been, you know, signers, threshold, and that's pretty much it. The current version is more granular. Like you can have, you know, spending limits, time locks. We now added, you know, roles. So you can say, for instance, this key can only initiate or only execute or only, uh, you know, vote on proposals. So I think we are bridging, bridging that gap. Uh, but also it's a, you know, constant trade off. You don't want to make things too complex. Like one one good thing is one good thing about multi-sigs is like they're very simple consensus mechanism. 
and hopefully yeah. they have less moving parts than you know a lot of other programs you regularly interact with on chain and that's how it right. should be and so we do see a huge value in it being a very you know simple and reliable uh, primitive and don't want to over overcomplicate it for now uh, but i think as we kind of one of my sort of bigger ideas is that um you know all wallets will eventually be smart wallets one way or the other uh just because why why wouldn't you want that if like if the access comparable and i also think a lot of the mpc offering um is very useful but i think as you can put more of these things on chain and you have an option of trusting you know a centralized company to secure that for you or just put all that logic on the centralized blockchain secured by validators uh i think uh, the, the second option is becoming more uh, attractive you know the further we develop this and so uh, I, I do expect the shift uh for more things at least of that nature to go on chain yeah that's I, I think that's really interesting to think about that as like the mpc wallet or the sharded wallet um as sort of a stepping stone to getting all this logic actually on chain it's an interesting kind of view of that um you know, you mentioned something around the idea that like all wallets will become smart contract wallets, and this is something that we've we've heard from the Ethereum community for a number of years at this point. And the barrier there has often been the cost to deploy the wallet is not zero. the The cost to create an account on Ethereum is zero. The cost to deploy a contract on Ethereum can be twenty dollars, two hundreds of dollars, depending on the gas fee at the moment, depending on the size of the program, etc. On Solana, that problem does not exist because transaction fees are, are quite low, but uh, state storage is still expensive on Solana. In addition to that, um, you know you have situations where uh, like Solana is, is a network that values program reusability. Um, so how are you thinking about like smart contracts in a world where uh, most people on Solana do not deploy their own minting contract for NFTs that 99.999% just use the Metaplex contract and, you know, so on and so forth. Like, is the is the smart contract wallet future for Solana, everyone's deploying their own programs or something else? Um, I'm, I'm going to talk in uh, sort of more abstract terms, not to reveal things we, we, we're we still sort of working on, but I think... Um, Oh, come you on, know, it's just us here. <laughs> sure. But if you look at Squad's protocol, right, it is very agnostic, right? What, what it really does is just it um, adds extra logic to PDAs, which natively exist on Solana, and basically uh, allows you to program how a PDA can manage a certain account, right? Mm -hmm. And that part is very agnostic, right? And so we are using it to deliver a multi-sig product where we're talking about you know organizations and teams and potential institutions managing on-chain assets together. But taking the same protocol and using it to power a more traditional wallet experience where it's uh, potentially, you know, a, a cold wallet, a cold storage alternative, or it's somewhere in the middle between cold storage and hot wallets, right? That's, that's very much possible. I think cost is much less of a barrier on, on Solana and um, it's still not as cheap as just using, you know, regular hot wallet. Um, yeah. But I think it, it is getting close. And so I think, um this the the cost can can go down right because i think like um we in terms of uh state storage yes it's expensive but there's you know the idea that like you can uh reclaim things after after some time and so get that get those sort of costs back i think also i've heard a lot that um at least that's how many people see the future that like actually providers and you know so sort of world providers will actually take on a lot of the cost uh, to facilitate that, and I think on Solana is just much more economically viable to do it as opposed yeah. to to doing it on on, on ETH. Um, so I think we're still not in a place where I can tell you with certainty this is how how it's going to work. I, I do feel like it definitely it, it definitely can work. And so to answer your question more directly, I don't think we're going to see like even you know with multi six today, like we have very sophisticated teams um, using squads. Like none of them actually want to deploy their own instance of squads and have the you know, have themselves burn the authority to that, you know, fork program. They just want, you know, to basically deploy, deploy a squad from our existing program, right? And, and this way, just because it's a lot more convenient and because they trust the, the core program. And I think when it comes to smart wallets, uh, sort of a couple of years into the future, if you look at Solana, you will see, I guess, a few standards that make account abstraction on Solana more manageable and easier to interact with for developers. And on top of that, you'll see, I think if you 
you know, retail facing, user facing products built, um, where you know each of those wallets, instead of being you know just a regular uh, regular wallet, will be you know a PDA under the hood. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about usability of squads and multisigs in general. Crypto is pretty famous for technically shipping technology, but not practically shipping technology. Um, and so from a usability perspective, um, it's great to say, like, look, we have all of this fundamental code that you can take and you can build really secure multisigs with. Um, but if it requires a very senior engineer to set up and use the system, the user adoption is just not going to be there, even at sort of the corporate level. Um, so talk a little bit about how you have thought about designing the interface side of a multi-sig program to meet sort of the needs of everyone from, you know, a small group of folks who want a multi-sig, a like three-person investment fund that they have up to the needs of, you know, a company that's deploying or a project that's deploying like mission critical programs on a network like Solana and their multi-sig needs are probably very different than that sort of first example. Absolutely, yeah. I think that that's a great question. I mean, Squad's you know interface today is really an sort of amalgamation of a bunch of uh, familiar flows and products that that you see in just completely different realms that uh, we fit to you know specific needs of of the users that that we have. And I think the the two big things you can sort of separate there is like one we call them you know treasury assets. That's you know your treasury management component, and then there's like developer assets. And I think. Uh, treasury assets uh, flows are much more familiar to you know Coinbase or you know your like more advanced you know fintech or sort of banking apps where you know particularly in the new UI that we're about to release you know it's like multiple accounts and it's like very transparent in terms of what assets you have dashboards analytics all that sort of information that makes it easier for you to manage the treasury on the developer side it's closer to you know Jira and Linear and it's really about you know how do you um, reflect those complex on-chain workflows that developers uh, have to interact with, you know, validators, tokens, and programs, and put them in a, you know, a familiar flow that can be an extension of their, you know, GitHub workflow, potentially can fit into their, uh, you know, sort of task management tooling. Uh, and so I yeah. think that, that's where the focus has really been, because like treasury and programs are the sort of the, really the killer features that, that we have in terms of um, what the interface really allows you to do. I think for program management, it really brought a lot of visibility, what we built just from a standpoint that it used to be all CLI, and now it's, you know, all an interface, there's upgrade history, you can, uh, you know, basically see all the upgrades, uh, there's a lot of instruction data that's that's getting parsed and, and sort of displayed for everybody to see. And so I think um, for me as being, you know, the, uh, I'm not on the developer side on our team, uh, being a non-technical co-founder, really, it's, it's very convenient to know what's going on, <laughs> like, yeah, the, you know, whenever we upgrade a program, like it's very clear what what we're doing, and uh, I think it's been we pretty much I think dog food everything we build just because the core like user archetype we're after um, is really a team like ourselves, um, and then there's sort of, sort of some ancillary users that definitely find Squad useful, but I think the, the majority of the user base today is just teams building things on Solana, just like us. Yeah, uh, so. Have you guys thought about, or do you have plans to do something along the lines of um, like user-facing information? So, for example, like you're, if there's a program managed by squads, inherently you know things like upgrade history, time locks, these sorts of things. Have you thought about like what either providing that data to explorers might look like, or creating some sort of like squads checker that's like a more consumer-facing side where, um, you know, if a program is said, "Hey, we're using squads as our multi-sig," or anyone as our multi-sig like i can go to a website and see oh it was last updated 10 days ago and that feels like a good long time or oh is that last updated 30 seconds ago maybe i should wait for a little bit and see if anything bad happens i mean that's um that's something that's so far uh we kind of let every project decide for themselves uh squad links are public uh right so if you have a if you have a right link you're able to see uh, all the squad details. You you're able to see all the, you know, basically all all the things that there are uh, in our interface. Anybody can have access to them if they have the link. And so there have been projects that would put it on their landing page under you know a button yeah. for you know treasury or you know, you know wh whatever it is. And so we've we've seen that with some of the NFT DAOs uh, in sort of in the last couple of years uh, that 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 been really active. And I think right now 
Um, we see, you know, like Jito guys would just post it publicly on Twitter. Like this is our multi-sig, which, you know, where we manage the programs. Um, I do think there's value in um, make, maybe making, you know, sort of a dedicated place where that can be visible. I think Explorers is, is definitely a good, uh, I think we'd start with Explorers, right? Like just making sure that they, um, you know, potentially can, can tag um, if, if a multi-sig is, you know, if, if it's a multi-sig, if it's a squads one. There's also a flip side to it that like a lot of our current users uh, use multi-sig, but they're not in a, in a place where like community has any control over anything. They're still very much, you know, centralized teams, companies building something and they're getting ready to decentralize, but they want to do it on their own terms. And so I think there is value in um, some of that being private, right? And so privacy is, uh, but I think from, from our sort of last year of active development, privacy came up more than the need for making things uh, more transparent. Interesting. But I think both are very important, right? But I, th I think teams care about privacy up until a certain moment, then they want complete transparency. And the community wants transparency sort of as soon as possible. And I always find it funny when like, you know, a team would raise uh, VC funding and then somebody on Discord would be like, so how how are we spending the money? <laughs> and it's yeah. just, just, a, just a random person there. But I think... Um, that also talks to talks. That also is, I think, relevant to the cultural shift I talked about before, where like there's you know the lines between sort of DAOs and and companies building things on chain are much more blurred now than they they used to be, and so I think we collectively just need to figure out what are the right tools for each stage of development of a project, right? And so we have been very much positioning ourselves as a tool for um, you know up until the moment you're ready to start giving up control over certain core on chain assets that you manage the squads. Um, you know, you use us, and then as you kind of transition to the DAO structure, there's sort of other tools that you can rely on in Solana ecosystem that's that's realms mostly. Yeah. That's I mean, that's an interesting way to kind of like think about that uh that connection there. Um I wanna I wanna pivot a little bit and talk about formal verification. Formal verification is a little bit of a touchy subject. Um, Squads v3, I think, was the first version you guys did as formal verification. Uh, there's a few programs on Solana, uh, I believe, that have been formally verified, but Squads is sort of the one most people are, are aware of. Talk a little bit about formal verification and what it does and also what it does not do. Right. Um, so I think quick, quick context in terms of how we got there. Um, I think formal verification was the sort of last frontier as we were kind of building out the sort of V3, the program, the security is, is top of mind with everything we do just because, um, you know, of what's at stake. And so, you know, security audits uh, are great. They help you identify vulnerabilities. But I was always asking, you know, everyone around me, like, what's this? Is there anything else we can do? Like, how can we, I want to be, you know, 100% certain. Like, how do I get yeah. to 100% certainty? And like, everybody would tell me it's not possible uh, to get to 100% certainty, but like formal verification is the sort of, you know, holy grail, the, the last thing that, um, like, if you do that, like, you're, you're very much solid. Um, so I think the way, uh, it, in, in a very non-technical way, uh, how I describe formal verification to people is that basically you mathematically verify um, what is possible to do uh, within a certain program and what's not. And uh, you really care about it because it, it basically allows you to mathematically prove that, you know, for instance, unless you meet a threshold in the multi-sig, the assets can go out, right? And I think that's just a very yeah. different approach to uh, to looking at the code as opposed to, you know, looking at from a stamp. Because like security audit auditors, they would come in and they would think like an attacker, like, you know, like Neodyme, Autocycle, all, all the great ones. They will um, think of it from a standpoint, like if, if I wanted to attack a program, like what would I do? Formal verification is this very different sort of more like mathematical academic type of approach to looking at the code base, which I thought was valuable in its own right, just because it's different. So I, I felt like we definitely need to get there uh, one way or the other. And so what I think the biggest complexity we found with formal verification, and we are about to like embark on this journey with the next program and uh, with, with more experience and, and understanding. I think the biggest complexity is like, it really is... Um, you, you you definitely need to identify the properties correctly that you want to verify because yeah. ver verifying every single thing in a complicated program is is very hard or nearly impossible. And so, you know, you, you definitely need both, uh, and you need your auditors to work with the team that's formally verifying to really understand, you know, what are the core properties that 
uh, you want to verify to make sure that, you know, f- for squads, actually, it's it's relatively straightforward just because, like, all, all you really care about is this consensus, right? Like, all you care about, mm. you know, can this be done if consensus has not been reached that, you know, the the, right. the, the, the team has set up when, when deploying a multisig. There is definitely, you know, sort of edge cases that are dangerous that you need to look out for, but they get more in a um, process, in, in, they get more in terms of, like, bricking or, you know, social engineering attacks, basically other things beyond um, kind of, you know, you know, pure on-chain vulnerability. And so formal verification for us, uh, to answer your question, like what, what it does and doesn't do, it's just, it, it does, it, what it did for us is like, it's been just a very different um, look at the program, which was really helpful. And also, you know, Autosec did a terrific job just because like they had to develop um, a framework before they could actually formally verify our own sort of program. And so um, I think it's been a learning curve for them, but it's also been interesting to go through the process uh, for us. And for the next program, we're actually probably going to do two formal verifications, uh, just with different teams to, again, just get as many eyes as possible on it and, and you know, to basically understand, uh, is there something we're not looking at? Um, but the, the, the thing that we kind of notice is like once the program is is secure and at least, you know, all, many auditors have looked at that, like all the core vulnerabilities have been identified. The auditors also start looking at things beyond that. It's like, you know, social engineering, like what if there's some malicious actor that is a signer on the multisig and like they want to do something there. And so you can actually like go uh, on, like to the top of the stack to sort of the front end and like see what can be done there. And so there's the, the room for you to do security work is sort of endless. And uh, we're just, we usually spend, you know, at least four months, four or five months total before, like, f- for all, like, the security processes that we have to say, okay, yeah. w- we're, we're starting to think about immutability now. And so I think for Breakpoint, that's what we're thinking for, for the next version of the program. Like, uh, w- that's when we can start thinking about immutability. Until then, it's more audits and uh, formal verifications. Nice. Uh, so I think my last question before we wrap up here today is around the business model. So you guys are venture-backed. You've raised You've raised rounds before. Um, you've been around for a while. Uh, what is the sort of monetization and the business functions around something like squads look like? It's undoubtedly a incredibly strong public good. Uh, but today, there's not really directly a fee to use squads. How have you seen either other multi-sigs in the industry be able to establish that? Um, or and where do you kind of see that going for squads? So we are... Um... We've been thinking about this a lot in the last sort of six months. Like the, the first um, six months since the launch of V3 just been very chaotic. And then and, and then also those months helped us solidify, you know, product market fit on Solana. And um, sort of starting from this year, we've been thinking a lot about what's the right path here. Because there's, you know, we have so many avenues um, to, to do it. The, the question is about doing it right. Um, yeah. And so the, the options that really we landed on are it's either... You know, the access to everything is completely free in terms of front end. Like, obviously, the program's open source, uh, you know, it exists on uh, on chain. Uh, but in terms of the front end, like, the experience that we provide is either completely free, but there are sort of internal fees involved uh, because we allow to do, you know, native um, staking, uh, liquid staking, swaps, uh, you know, tons of integration that we work on, and then, like, additional features on the developer side. Uh, they definitely are, I think, fall in the bucket of, like, added value as opposed to being yeah. there with, like, the basic sort of version of the product. Uh, so that's like one option, and and then the other one is where it's more about uh, some you know features are like the core stuff is free, but then uh, the, the advanced features are gated uh, through you know whether it's a subscription or like a more sort of crypto native way of of generating revenue. That, that's uh, that's more about form, less about substance. But that, that's where we sort of have landed in terms of like other like you know safe uh, on EVM doesn't directly monetize their UI. They're I think more going in the direction of they're you know encouraging protocols to build on top and and they encourage more UIs to be built and I guess right I actually don't know exactly what the business model there is I think at the moment it's not also fully implemented um, and then uh, MPC providers and sort of you know wallet as a service it's all sort of subscription based with uh, you know sort of um, gated by gated by subscription but also there's like usage metrics that uh, can lead you to sort of being charged more. I think today, the way we're seeing it on Solana, uh, we can definitely, with offering that we have, fall in line with you know RPC providers, uh, on-chain indexing, like basically all the 
sort of on-chain services that you as a startup building something on Solana rely on. Uh, so we do see a potential for us to fit in, in there. And then as we are thinking about like more institutional customers, there's like other models because like I think um, MPC institutional wallets, like they charge you a flat fee and then there's also like a certain bips they charge on on volumes and, and swaps and like what you see deals. So as, as these things scale, uh, it can sort of become more apparent. But for now, uh, that's sort of the thought process we went through. Uh, I, it's kind of one of these perennial things in crypto, which is how the most technically valuable and socially valuable uh, assets and protocols built on top of networks can actually monetize. Uh, this is not a squad specific or multi sig specific thing, but you, you see this across the board where some of the most useful and powerful work, um, you know, the, the business models maybe haven't quite caught up yet, uh, or the paying customers haven't quite decided it's worth paying for yet uh, to get there. Which is interesting. Like we sort of have a, like an app store problem where you know people will gladly go and spend twenty dollars to go see a movie, but they won't spend three dollars on an app. Um, it's kind of interesting to to think about. Like a lot of like the core infrastructure of crypto is sort of still in that place right now today. Yeah, and and I don't agree. I think like when you think about the magnitude uh, or in terms of like the impact that managing these assets that you know our users manage for squads. Like the, the impact that it can potentially have if there are any issues, right? And basically the the value that's being secured, same goes for safe on EVM. And but we are seeing though some UIs on top of safe starting to monetize. And it is looking a lot more, I think it, it's very much defined by the user archetype you're after. So if we're talking about organizations and startups, you know, SaaS model really comes, uh, f- becomes really familiar to many of these teams first. And like everybody's talking about subscriptions. Um, and I think, um, we definitely would like to be slightly more creative there, but um, I also think that that is a uh, that's that's something that you know crypto companies should start experimenting for uh, with, with as well because like I haven't seen that done um, meaningfully on Solana uh, ever, and so it definitely would be interesting to see how that how that can work. Agreed. Well, uh, Stefan, thank you for joining us today on Validated. Thank you, Austin. It's been it's been a fantastic experience. Mm-hmm.